travelers, and welcome to another episode of Tales of Tavat, a Genshin lore podcast. Last week, we discussed the twin archons and questioned whether or not we would sacrifice our bodies for our siblings. Our hosts are still pretty torn on our answers for that. This week, though, we'll be discussing some more body doubles in the event Shadows and Mist Snowstorms. Additionally, I want to remind travelers to visit TalesOfTavat.com to see visual representations of the lore mentioned during today's podcast. Your guides have put them together for you to make things a little easier to understand. On our site, you can also find some awesome goodies, including artist spotlights from the community for each episode, wallpapers for download, and a way to check out some of our favorite Genshin merch. Finally, feel free to email us at talesofthevotpod at gmail.com to let us know what you think of this week's episode and what topics you'd like to see in the future. I want to start off by saying, though, that this episode's going to be a little different than what we've done in the past. Mm -hmm. We had one of our friends actually come up to us and tell us that, you know, they were having some issues with getting coverage of some of the events and, like, the lore mentioned during these events. And as I think we've all mentioned in some previous episodes, the one bad thing about Genshin that we can all agree on at least is that they do put a lot of lore in these limited events that we then don't get if you're a new traveler and I think we saw that with Unreconciled Stars which is one of the very first updates with the whole the sky isn't real (laughs) thing so we decided that we wanted to cover everything that was in Shadows Amidst Snowstorms which is the Sus Beto event Um, as some of you have probably heard us refer to it it is when there is a Albedo imposter out and about in Monster that it was an amazing amazing time it was when i also got my first albedo so i was very excited about it so we're gonna talk about that but you also got your first albedo sword right but didn't know yes so i (laughs) during this event you could get the cinnabar spindle and all of its what are they not cons like the refinements Refinements, yeah yeah. All, all the refinements for it and i didn't think i got it until like eight months later when I saw it in my inventory. <laughs> Complained the whole time <laughs> that it wasn't available. <laughs> now my Albedo doesn't even have it on him. I have I have a different sword on him. It was him. so funny. I mean, you have Miss Splitter, so like, look. <laughs> I'm living my best life. But we did decide that we were going to do this episode about this event. So this episode will not be about Albedo. At the end, we might talk a little bit about Albedo specifically, just because of some theories and stuff that come out of this event. We will just be sticking to the event, though, for the most part, because we have found from fans and our friends that you can only really understand the lore mentioned during this event if you watch the entire event on YouTube. And that's like three hours of your time and you have to watch it and that can be really hard for people so we thought it might be nice for us to try to condense it in about an hour (laughs) and kind of give you like the suspedo for dummies version so yeah so that's what we're gonna be doing today let's do it so this event happened in what november 2021 yes i don't know was that 2.8 uh 2.3 i think i started playing at 2.4 Five, whenever Yai Miko came out was when I started playing. Y'all were playing at the time, so you guys got to experience this. Yeah. And me, I'm like, oh, Albedo, I would love to get like his best in slot sword. Nope. You mean I can't? <laughs> Never. Ever again. <laughs> and we we've talked about this and how like we all hate this limited time events that lock away lore. And a lot of that lore comes from these weapons that you can get, and even sometimes like the little furniture stuff that you can get, like in the Darshan event. But I'm like, I, I wish they would put <laughs> Just put those limited time weapons just randomly in the weapon banner. I mean, I get that there's like, if you don't play the event, you don't get the weapon, but the lore part. Yeah, because it's like, it becomes almost like a an incentive, a gift, all that kind of stuff to say, like, you're going to get these little extra perks if you play the events, because you can still skip an event even when you are playing. Mm-hmm. But to lock behind lore and it really important lore. Yeah. You know, it just seems like, it's like a bad plan. <laughs> I will say currently a lot of the events don't lock away heavy, heavy lore since this particular event. Yeah, because everyone bit. It was the one that we that Fiends mentioned before with the skies 
not real. And then this one, those are the two biggest ones. Yeah. You missed some fun stuff. <laughs> but I will say that like Al's point, it would be nice at least if they did kind of like what they do with the skins where you could buy the weapons using Genesis crystals in the store. Yeah. That would be a cool idea to let people get event limited things. Like Hoyo can be like, all right, you didn't do it. Let's make money then. <laughs> yeah. yeah, basically. Yeah. Like you get it for free if you play the event, but you have to like, you know, cough up cash. Good point. Yeah. I just, I love the events and I, I love being part of it. But like when I first started, I wanted to get Yai and I wanted to do the Inkanomiya event, but I hadn't even gotten to Inazuma at the time. And by yeah. the time I did, the event was over. So a lot of like cool stuff people got to experience. You don't get to experience if you just start because it takes so long to get to the point where you can, ah, yes, let me just do all these quests. Like there's memes on Twitter and just reddit of oh you want to play this event here's the 20 quests you have to complete before or you can just do quick start and i'm like oh my heart yeah it's definitely a lot but for this event there's two things i want to say before we jump into the lore of it and actually talk about the event was one i think my mouth was gaped like 80 percent of the time <laughs> and two i think that the cutscene from the like the cutscene y'all know the cutscene i'm talking about is one of the top five cinematic masterpieces of genshin impact oh it was so wild to me like the whole fight scene and everything like top five for me yeah we're gonna include a link on the site that goes to a video that will actually show that cutscene. It's from the YouTuber Cat with Blue Hat. They go through the whole event in a faster timeline too. Like it's not actually watching the playthrough, but they kind of give you the snippets along the way. But they kind of like, all right, this was so good. We got to stop and show you because it's it's that good. So definitely check that out on our site. So now I'm going to transport all of you to Monsat in November of 2021 when an unsuspecting traveler is talking with Paimon and Paimon is talking about how she wants to make like a juicer machine but at the same time she really just wants to like keep fruit good so that it doesn't go bad so i'm like do you just want a freezer like i'm not a you want a juicer but it should be a freezer i'm not really 100 percent sure she wants a smoothie is what she wants but how do they not already have a juicer i don't know it's a good question we'll find one in fontaine <laughs> I did a, a daily in Monster very recently, and it was when I was already kind of rewatching this entire event and started thinking about the juicer again, because I was kind of like, what do you mean you don't have a juicer? And there's one event <laughs> where one of the dailies where you have to go help this dude and you fight off like, you know, the hilly trails and stuff like that. And he says, like, thank God you got here or else the only thing left would have been pulp and the fruit would have been hurt, too, which was mm. very funny. But I'm like, well, <laughs> if he knows that you can make pulp out of the fruit. They got to juice something. So they're hold We're holding back on Paimon and her tummy. Here's the thing. We could already be like, be able to juice things. It's just not efficient. You know, like you take like a thousand, you know, lemons and do the squeezy squeeze. It's just a funny way to start the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I love Tiff's Italian jumping out. What do you mean <laughs> you don't have a juicer? <laughs> okay. When I get a little passionate, my Jersey and my Italian just comes out. <laughs> it's actually my Jersey italian -ness. <laughs> But so we decide that we're going to go talk to the alchemists of Mondstadt. And we head over to the alchemy table where we run into Sucrose and Timaeus having a nice little cash conversation after Albedo has left. And they mention that Albedo is kind of uncharacteristically upset at Timaeus. Which, like, Al I've never seen Albedo mad at anyone except for Cyrus for talking too much. <laughs> Understandable. Though Cyrus, I don't know who's the voice actor for Cyrus, but every time I listen, I'm like, is that Matt Mercer? It's Sean Chiplock. <laughs> oh, so D. Luke voices Monstat Cyrus. Got it. <laughs> wow. Good thing. I'm glad that he got some some money out of that one. <laughs> oh my god, I didn't even realize. It sounded so much like Matt Mercer. Oh my god. And to confirm, Matt Mercer is not in Genshin. No. Shame! So, can we talk about Cyrus? Because I thought I was going crazy. I was like, wait, Cyrus? Lisa Cyrus? Sinos Cyrus? Yeah, I remember him just because hot. This is not the same Cyrus. <laughs> so, there are two Cyruses in the game, and we actually meet the Adventurer's Guild Cyrus first. He has a monocle. He's super cool. And we'll meet him in the quest in a minute. But he usually is like hanging out outside of the Adventurer's Guild building, just kind of vibing around, doing his thing. But we talk with Timaeus and Sucrose about how we want to make this 
juicer and they're like oh you just missed albedo we're like ah oh, damn all right so we decide that we're gonna go out to dragon spine and follow albedo so we could go you know have paimon ask about this juicer because he's the expert apparently so we get out there and we stop at the base camp at dragon spine where there's some like little buildings and things i've always been very suspicious of that area i don't know if anyone else ha- is yeah it's neat though that we first learn about chilled meat and we get to make something that will make you not die as fast on dragon spine which is lovely goulash yes goulash goulash, thank you i forgot what it was called (laughs) it will help you both in genshin and in cold winters in poland it's goulash polish al it's just like eastern european i would consider kind of like how borscht is also eastern european oh i think i was thinking borscht because i was gonna say isn't goulash kind of Russian? She does nine. I was like, hmm, question. Kind of. I mean, it would make sense. Like, oh, like dragon spine is so cold. People who are from the cold know how to do with the cold. And so they brought their dishes here. I mean, osmosis, right? Osmosis Jones. Osmosis Jones. Yeah, I think it is just Eastern European because it's in a lot of different countries and kind of like a staple, a home staple. So I would just, I just say it's Eastern European. Okay, okay. I was just curious. So then we get there and we start talking with Cyrus, who Brandon just brought up. And Cyrus starts telling us about how they're doing training for the Adventurers Guild on Dragonspine. They call it Winter's Training. Which kind of doesn't make sense to me because I, I feel like there aren't seasons in Mondstadt. That's so funny. I didn't even think of that. I mean, with dragon spine snow, it's always winter. Was it matter? Oh, that's funny. Yeah, and Cyrus is saying how they had a person who was supposed to step in and that and do some of the training, and that adventurer was Fischl, and Fischl couldn't make it? Question mark. Like, what was Fischl doing? She's busy. She has, like, a whole kingdom to worry about. Oh, my God. Leave her alone. (laughs) I think Amy was grounded. (laughs) (laughs) No, Brandon has a good point. The princessin is very busy. Yeah, being grounded. Oz was probably like, I'm not going out there. (laughs) You can do this on your own. (laughs) And she was like, maybe I'll stay. (laughs) His feathers would freeze. And so we find out that Fischl can't do her thing and that she found an adventurer to fill in for her. But that adventurer is missing in action currently. They do not know where they are, who they were supposed to be. But no adventurer has showed up to fill Fischl's spot. Maybe this was like the point when Fischl went over to Honkai Impact. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> When Fisher was announced to be in Hong Kai, and maybe two point three was at the same time. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the timeline for sure. So no, I'm, I'm calling it now. It's a no. <laughs> <laughs> no, because and Fischl stays in Honkai. It's not like she comes back. And Fischl's had a whole event that she's in from last summer. So no. Well, I mean, people have died in Honkai and you can still play with them. So that doesn't mean anything. That's different. Honkai defies all rules. Yes. That's why Tiff hates it. Yes, there you go. There, uh, thank you. I'm gonna <laughs> use that one now. <laughs> if Fischl ends up in Star Rail, I'm gonna be like Okay. <laughs> What's happening? I would be so excited. I would be so happy. <laughs> it's just Fischl disassociating into new realities. <laughs> Fischl wakes up. She's actually in a psychiatrist's office. We're all living office. in Fischl's world. <laughs> yeah. No! <laughs> Is this just the plot line of Sucker Punch? <laughs> no! Anyway, Fischl... Unknown adventurer, MIA. So Miss Amber shows up and Miss Amber is like, don't worry about it. We got this, Cyrus. Eula's going to help us out. And Eula shows up and is like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that? Yeah. Hey. She, she puts up the peace sign. <laughs> She's like, hmm. And for whatever reason, Eula is used to Dragon Spine. I didn't understand why. Well, she's an adventurer, so maybe she had a lot of commissions that she had to do. Well, no, she's not an adventurer. She's a knight. She's the captain of the reconnaissance. Yeah. 
What right? does that mean, though? Like, what is that? You got to scope out your area. Yeah. You got to stalk people. You got to stalk the lands. Mm-hmm. Know where people might be hiding. Yeah, like reconnaissance people, like, go and scope things out before the main army or group advances. Okay. Didn't they show her, like, doing her flamingo dance in her trailer, like, <laughs> at Dragonspine? Oh, my God. Because that's honestly what I thought she was doing there. Well, I don't think it was at Dragonspine, but yeah. And she's cryo. So probably everything looks like Dragon Spine when she's, you know, doing her thing. Why do you hate Eula? <laughs> I don't hate Eula. I was just like ununderstanding because they really only associate Dragon Spine with Albedo. Oh, so you can't have two people like Dragon Spine? Are no. you threat as Albedo You're threatened. threatened by Eula? <gasps> Brandon, you're right. Albedo's family lives there, and he has a home there. Eula doesn't. Well, I, I don't think Eula's trying to live there. <laughs> Eula's like, ugh, why am I here? She doesn't care. Yeah. I'm not threatened by her. Anyway, so Amber <laughs> then introduces us to Joel, who we've already met, if you've finished the Joel quest line. But for travelers who don't know, Joel is a little boy that hangs out at the base camp looking for his missing in action father. Orphan alert. Orphan alert. <laughs> I love I love that that's become a thing. <laughs> He's a temporary orphan. He's looking for his dad. Well <laughs> I don't know about that one. Yeah. <laughs> Temporary-ish. <laughs> he thinks he's got a dad. So, anyway, Amber and Eula and us decide that we're going to help Joel make a snowman. And if you got to play the event, you might remember the fact that one of the little side things you could do for fun to get primos and other rewards was building snowmen with Joel. And it was amazing. I could use eggs for eyes. That's you. I hated it. What? Why'd you hate it? I hated the little trials to get all the snowman pieces. It was frustrating. What? Yeah, I never. I don't have no snowman. <laughs> I think I have the body of a snowman sitting in my teapot, and that's it. Yeah, I really didn't like it. You love a squirrel, but you hated the snowman. All right. Wait, which ones did you not like? Because I think some of them were easier than others. Did you not like the ones where you have to like run up and down the mountain? Yes. And yeah. like get here and there. And then like I couldn't figure out who I was going after because then I got hilly trails after me and it was just bang. Or was it all that? I thought maybe that was just one part of it. I forgot. I just went, you know what? I don't, I don't need to finish the part. I'm going to stick to the event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, if you actually just generally liked Dragon Spine like you should, <laughs> no. those little trials would have been easy for you. Anyway, so Amber, Yule, and us decide we're going to help him make the snowman, blah, 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 blah. So Amber goes off to find snowman parts, leaving us with Yula and Joel. And Yula happens to mention that she's never made a snowman before. For. And for someone who's used to Dragon Spine, that kind of broke my heart. I mean, she grew up very stunted and traumatized and had a very conservative parental figure. She had no time for frivolity. Just flamingo dancing. Yes. Flamingo dancing, chess, swordsmanship. This poor girl had a lesson every day. I love that y'all are saying flamingo dancing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not flamingo, <laughs> but flamingo. Yeah. <laughs> I like flamingos. <laughs> but we do eventually leave Eula and Joel on their own, and we continue up on the dragon spine to find Albedo. Also, just fun fact is immediately calls her Auntie Eula, which Aww. is so cute. I wonder if like her heart like grew three sizes like the Grinch is at that moment. I think it did. <laughs> oh, Eula, so sweet. She's like, not only is my girlfriend here volunteering me to help with stuff, but this little boy likes me. <laughs> so sweet and she was kind of like awkward about it i mean most gay people are awkward around children so i really like that <laughs> i'm dead <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we continue our way up Dragon Spine, and we hear some like suspicious noises, and Paimon's kind of like, what is that? But then, quickly after hearing the noises, we run into the one and only, we think, Albedo. And Albedo's kind of like, what are y'all doing here? Why are you on Dragon Spine? <laughs> because he's so used to not seeing people on Dragon Spine. And we tell him a little bit about the training and everything going on, but we just in case he hears noises or anything, you know, that there are people out and about. But then we also tell him about our juicer situation, coming full circle to the very beginning of the story. And Albedo doesn't help us right away with the juicer. I actually don't even know if we mentioned the juicer to him right away now that I'm thinking about it. We instead get into a conversation about pain 
painting. And Paimon very rudely says that we should learn how to paint, as in the Traveler, so that we can entertain Paimon when we're camping out. Don't hate on Paimon. I love that Paimon passionately loves painting. Like, she really likes it. And this comes up again during the current event that's happening right now. We're recording this in early July of 2023. I'm talking about Bottle Land. And this comes up again. There's a mural world quest that you can do. And Paimon's like fascinated by the idea of like creating art. And I love that. Yeah, but in this event, the the Suspedo event, Paimon loves the idea of us learning, not her. She has no <laughs> desire to be the one painting at that point. She's like, you're gonna learn, traveler. She's trying to give us some some culture. No, she's trying to give us some more shit to put on our to-do list. Like we're gonna <laughs> get burned out. Like, where are we burned out, Paimon? Then that leads into a conversation with Albedo about Star Silver, and he actually tells us he's on Dragon Spine looking for a specific type of star silver because star silver that's like a certain color is actually really good to be used to be made into paints, which ends up being a super important little fact to know later down the line. So we have this conversation with Albedo about the star silver. We go back to his lab slash camp. I really don't know what to call it because there's no bed referred to it yeah they refer to it as a camp but it is it's his laboratory yeah it's <laughs> interesting but then again i guess we later learn he could draw himself a bed and then get rid of it i don't know would you call it his cinna home <laughs> i just wanted to make that joke <laughs> yeah i would call it a cinna apartment oh. <laughs> a cinna condo yeah. his cinna loft yeah the cinna condominium yeah the Cinna Airbnb. Because <laughs> the Cinna home's over near the Cinnabar Cliff. In the chasm. In the chasm. Yeah. <laughs> I got a lot of questions about that, by the way, still. Like, the Cinnabar Cliff in the chasm is a tourist spot that tourists don't go to. <laughs> like, Cinnabar. I have a lot. I'm not going to talk too much about the Cinnabar Spindle, oh, though. Speaking of tourists, I don't think we even talked about the fact that this whole event coincided with a real life event at <gasps> the Matterhorn oh my and God. the Swiss Alps. <laughs> I never wanted to go to the Swiss Alps more in my life. <laughs> Who does? Exactly. It was the only time I wanted to go. I mean, I would love to go to the Swiss Alps, honestly. But, but only at this point. No. <laughs> I'd like them to put the waypoint back. So yeah, the Swiss Alps at the same time, they had a huge Genshin event going on. Because as some of you might remember from our Dragon Spine episode, Dragon Spine is actually inspired by the Matterhorn. While this event was going on in Tavat on Earth, they were doing this huge event where they actually put a giant waypoint on the Swiss out. <laughs> and people like went there and there was like a big event. And I think there were like fireworks, if I'm remembering correctly. Like there's a video. It felt so random. <laughs> So random, but so good. But like, that's Genshin's MO. It was like just the most random tie-ins. Yeah. And you know, it really hurts me because they don't bring any of that stuff to the States, really. Like the Pizza Hut collab, the Kiehl's collab, the KFC, they're all international. Like none of them happen here. Please bring the Pizza Hut collab here. Yeah. Like I would order Pizza Hut. I really would. I love Pizza <laughs> Hut. I promise if you bring it here, I will eat the pizza. Yeah. Or better yet, just do Domino's. I really like Domino's. No. no. <laughs> Brandon's like, Pizza Hut or Die Hut. <laughs> <laughs> but they actually have a really cool video. I don't remember if it was a live stream or a video they did afterwards that's on their YouTube channel. We'll link it on the page in case anyone's interested in seeing a little bit more about their Matterhorn Swiss Alps event. But when we get to Albedo's lab, we find that it has been ransacked. Genshin didn't put a lot of detail into the animation of a ransacked lab. But the one thing they did do, which I thought was so funny was knock over the alchemy table. <laughs> like, Suspedo, who we assume is the person, you know, who did this, just got so angry and was like, ugh, alchemy table <laughs> shoved over? Like, <laughs> Makes sense. Like, he could have knocked over the fire pit and lit the whole thing on fire if he wanted to, but he didn't. Well, we learn that glass blowing is a very rare art in Tibet, but things are broken. When do we learn that? Because Al Albedo says it when when we're looking at the glass. Oh, does it? Oh, yeah, I was I didn't remember. Yeah, that's such a random fact. Well, he describes it when he's talking about the mark on his throat. Oh yeah. Mm, okay, later on. Like that's basically the 
the end of a, a glass blow. I wonder where glass blowing happens then, because we really haven't seen anything. I would say maybe not long, because if we think of how high of temperatures you need to actually get to mold glass like that volcanic would work yeah that's true did we talk about this before or was this a new event where they're talking about glass and like how rare it is i was thinking back like wait do we see glass in other cities Mm. they're always drinking out of like old meaty looking like chalices yeah like they look like wouldn't like yeah i think i feel like glass might actually be rare yeah do we see glass at the winery maybe oh that's interesting you're looking for glass i don't know you know i haven't finished bottle land i'm not finished with it yet so i haven't seen anything about like glass blowing that is a very interesting thing i mean i could be making this a no i doubt it do you remember this at all no no i i don't maybe it was somewhere else but i feel like there was something about like glass being precious because i remember thinking back like wait isn't there glass everywhere and then i was like wait maybe there's not Ooh, interesting I have to pay more attention to that it might be in the mural quest that i was talking about yeah i didn't I do any of those little side ones yet so like al said you know you have the table pushed over you have a lot of the glasses broken on the ground i also want to note though besides the fact the thief you know the guy who broke in could have destroyed everything totally completely with fire they also could have left it in a way where no one would have ever known that someone had broken in so i felt like it was almost like a purposeful thing if that makes sense like it was like a bitter like i was here bitch well, they they also took the alchemy notes, so mm-hmm. you would have known something went missing. Yeah, but it would have taken a while. I think it was meant to lure Albedo out. Mm, possibly. They didn't really have to do that hard of a job to break in, though, because it's a giant cave. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> His doesn't have much security going on there. But is that not another point, though, too? Is like, it's not like they had to break everything. Like, they very much either went, did it out of spite or did it to draw attention. It's also not like Albedo needs to to live in a freaking cave <laughs> he doesn't he goes back to the knights of Favonius. i am convinced every night that's where he sleeps <laughs> but albedo's like a little upset about it and he finds footprints and he decides that we should follow the footprints to try to find the thief at this point yes so we go with albedo and we end up in a cave one of my least favorite caves in the whole goddamn game i didn't know that you ranked caves <laughs> yeah you what's your, your list of caves what's your listing yeah <laughs> well i mean this cave sucks the amount of events that we've had to do in this goddamn cave it was horrible it's the star glow cavern like do you guys not dislike star glow cavern is that the one where you go to the bottom and you have to do the time yes. thing that is like the biggest nightmare in yes. the game yes exactly yeah, i'm with you thank you finally someone who gets me oh no <laughs> So Albedo turns to us and Albedo's like, you stay here because there's no other way out of this cave. And then we can kind of like stop them from coming out, basically, because I'll be following them and you'll be here. So they'll get like sandwiched in and they'll get stuck. And we're like, yeah, you right, Albedo. So we are sitting there waiting. We end up picking some star silver that we think looks good for Albedo while waiting. We never see anyone run out except for Albedo. He comes back and Albedo's like, hey. And we're like, so did you get him? And he's like, get who? And Paimon's like, the thief. And Albedo takes a second. He's like, oh no, I, he must have got, he got away. And we're all like, damn it. Oh, so close. So then Paimon happens to mention like, hey, yo, we picked you some star silver. You know, we think we got the one that you said was good, but can you confirm? And Albedo says something a little suspicious, something along the lines of like, uh, humans, like they care too much about these like trivial matters Mm -hmm. and they're so wasteful. And we're like, okay, we then hear some noises and we separate from Albedo and we go and we find Bennett locked in a cage where you would expect Bennett to end up. Yeah. None of us is surprised by this. Okay. I was surprised. I was like, what are you doing on Dragonspine in a cage? Like what stuff are you getting into? He has no... No luck. He knows it. <laughs> and if anybody's going to get stuck in a random cage, it's Bennett. A hundred percent. Yep. Does Bennett know how he got in the cage? Yes. Bad luck. Bad luck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A, a snowball fell on his head and it was filled with gravel. <laughs> 
Like there was ro- there were rocks in the snow that fell on his head somehow, and he was sort of disoriented, probably concussed, and like wandered into the cage. <laughs> that is so dangerous so dangerous how has this boy survived that's a great question who knows razor yeah (laughs) if this happened to anybody else if it was like a snowball full of gravel fell on their head we'd be like that's crazy why would that have happened it happened to bennett we're like oh yeah that makes sense (laughs) (laughs) totally i see it if anybody doesn't know too just as a little sidebar if anybody doesn't know ben it's really bad luck please do his hangout it's very funny the boy it's it's surprising that he's survived it's yeah it's one of the better hangouts for sure don't forget he was born on leap day of leap years (laughs) he he makes a birthday once every four years Mm-hmm. <laughs> he was born right into that bad luck. Paimon actually asks, like, didn't Razor want to come with you? And Benny says, Razor is not an adventurer. <laughs> Razor is like the homebody, whereas Benny's like wandering around. So they just couldn't afford Todd that time. <laughs> That's when we find out that like Bennett was supposed to replace Fischl. Like Bennett is this unknown adventurer yes. that was supposed to take Fischl's place. And of course he went MIA because this gravel filled snowball hit him in the head and he tumbled into a cage can i ask one question do they actually say that or do we just assume it i think it's an assumption but they don't say till later i think they imply it yeah because it just makes me go is there something else going on like maybe i'm just sus of everything because of this event (laughs) the sus event yeah (laughs) i think benny is actually says something about it okay like i i came here to do such and such Ah, and then a snowball fell on me (laughs) (laughs) and then my luck prevailed and so we help bennett out of the cage as a good friend does and we turn and albedo's not with us anymore right like he's gone he like went whoosh vanished then we run into eula and amber And Albedo's back. And Eula gets real snippy with Albedo and is like, why did you almost kill Joel? Because she was with Suspedo. Yes, which we don't know yet, though. Right, right. However, I think it might have been the other one. Whoppy? Mm Mm-hmm. Mostly because it seems like Suspedo, though cynical and a dick, isn't actively trying to kill everyone else. Well, okay, so I think of Wappy as Suspedo. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Because he's like the fake that we deal with the most, right? Yeah, just for people who don't know this part. There are three, that's why we're mentioning. There's there's the regular Albedo, there's Suspedo, and then there's Wappy, who will come into play a little bit later on. So that's why we're talking about three of them at this point. But in this part of the event, at this moment when Eula is saying, hey, Albedo, why did you try and kill Joel and throw him off a cliff? Albedo's like, "Mm, that wasn't me. That must be the (laughs) imposter. So this is when we first learn about our first imposter. Right. And at this point, this is when we're first figuring out that there might be an imposter too, because Albedo is like, whoa, what? And Eula's like, yeah, that's right. And then when I tried to approach you about it, you threw Joel on the ground and then attacked me, which is like, I think we mentioned an episode or two ago, something about Eula having Albedo PT. TSD. <laughs> yeah. And this just like really drove that home for me. And Eula is very suspicious of even the real Albedo at this point because she's like, I don't know who to trust. And that's when Albedo is like, oh my God, I think I know what's going on. I think that there's an imposter. Because when we run into Albedo at this point again, he's like, did you catch the bad guy coming out of the cave? And we're like, no, no one came out except for you. So now we're also putting two and two together that when we talk to the Albedo that didn't know what we were talking about, with the star silver and everything, that we must have run into this imposter. And for travelers who played the event or who are going to watch it after listening to this episode, you will notice that the albedo that emerges from the cave first does not have a star on his neck. And that's really important. I think some of us, when we were playing it, caught on to that. I know I did. I was like, what the fuck is this? What is happening? I was so, I was, like, I was, I remember freaking out about it. I don't know, B and Tiff, if you noticed it right away too. No, I didn't notice it at this point. I did later on, but yeah, no, with the cavern, didn't even give it a second thought. Mm -hmm. What about you, B? Did you notice it? At this point, no, I did not. So, 
after this whole conversation, Albedo's like, I think we have an imposter. Eula decides she's going to trust Albedo because he is a captain in the Knights of Avonius with her. And, you know, she does believe that she has to trust her fellow knights, which I thought was really, like, cool of her. Like, of course, she keeps her own suspicions in the back of her head. But I thought that was, like, very valiant of her. I really love that Eula <laughs> says to Amber, if you ever get paired with Bennett, wait for me and I will come with you. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, don't do it, Amber. So like his luck is that bad that she's like, don't ever go out with Bennett alone. <laughs> <laughs> it's a smart choice because though he has bad luck, he's not the one dying. <laughs> he's right. Everyone else around him. Right. Mm -hmm. R.I.P. his parents. You got a point there, Al. So, at this point, Eula, Amber, and Bennett decide that they should actually go back and meet up with Cyrus back at the base camp at Dragonspine. And that they really need to go check in with him and kind of give him a heads up about what's been going on. And also let him know that they found Bennett. <laughs> in the meantime, we go back to Albedo's lab where he informs us the he is a synthetic human made out of alchemy by his master, Gold. This is where the mouth gaped and never, like, closed for me. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He doesn't tell us a lot about it, but he does give us this, like, heads up that he's not a real human and that, you know, he's kind of worried that whoever stole his alchemy notes might be trying to do something and now he's he's very concerned mm -hmm. about this imposter idea as you should be if someone's impersonating you mm -hmm. he, I mean, and God. he says that his mother ryan daughter aka gold was a researcher from conria yes which i yeah. never heard of her referred to as a researcher outside of albedo really mm -hmm. she's usually a witch or a sinner <laughs> yeah he also mentions there that he was born or created after Conria was destroyed. Yes. The way that he says it makes me go, okay, is he one of those people that, like, he's like 500 years old, but looks like he's 18, 20 years old? Yeah. He admits during this event that he is older than his appearance suggests when he came into being. So we know minimally the oldest he could be is 500. Yeah. Which is a little reassuring, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> you know. For me. So Albedo also mentions at this point that his master, Gold, also created Durin, whose body is at Dragonspine. And he does mention in the same breath that the blood of Durin that flows throughout the mountain can do some really weird things, can enhance creatures. Like, he does tell us that, like, suspicious things can happen on Dragonspine because of the blood of Durin being in Dragonspine, basically. Uh, for travelers who don't know, you can actually go to Warmrest Valley and actually see Durin's skull, some of his ribs, and you can find what we assume is his heart. Not very far from Alvedo's camp. He's keeping an eye on his brother <laughs> over there. And I have a bone to pick, no pun intended. <laughs> a bone about his bones. <laughs> There's some weird timeline stuff happening with like Durin and albedo being made at the same time ish and the cataclysm and yeah albedo tells us like come back to me in a few days and if you hear anything see anything suspect anything with the imposter like we'll check in report back so we come back to albedo's lab a few days later and basically we're like albedo like we found nothing and at this point, we decide, I don't know, we hear something and we go out and we see Eula, Amber, and Bennett. And we're like, why are you guys back here? And they're like, we haven't made it back to base camp yet. And Bennett is basically blaming himself. <laughs> He's like, it's all my fault. It's my bad luck. Aww. And Albedo's like, no, weird shit happens on Dragon's Spine. And so Albedo and them are like, you guys must be tired. Come on into the lab. We'll spend the night here. And then we'll head back together in the morning. Like, I'll help you guys. Like, I'm up here all the time. This is my favorite part. This is where things get very gay. But can we just talk <laughs> for a second about the fact that, like, they were walking around Dragonspine for days? Days. Days. Like, it almost made me suspicious. Like, did they, like, know that they were wandering for days? 
Because the only reason we really know it's been days is because it says that we come back a few days later. Like, it's like, you know, check in with Albedo in two days type of thing. Like, it almost makes me think of, like, the whole child in the abyss thing where, like... (laughs) He thought he had been in the abyss for three days, but it had been three months. Well, did it unlock after a couple days or something? I don't know. But it's, you know, when you do one of those things where it's like, it says like your event will say. Yeah, like, like wait until such yeah, and such time. It said yeah. to come back in like two days. So you could fast forward through it, but you had to wait two days. Yeah. Mm. I have questions. You know, they don't ever really approach that with Eula, Bennett, and Amber. Like, none of them really give you any hints if they knew they were out for days or not. Well, I mean, that's sort of a bigger question, right? Of, like, we all can run from Mondstadt to Springvale, like, in, like, a minute. But in the game itself, like, if it were an anime, it would probably take, like, a day for them to get there, right? Isn't everything sort of shrunken? in the world you know like you can run from a rainforest into the desert in no time but like it's all sort of shrunken like it would take way longer in real life well i was gonna say (laughs) beans is doing her own experiment on this yeah so last week so for travelers you probably know but i write my own fan fiction about a character named nat and nat lives in mondstadt but has to travel to leeway like once a week once every other week for her job so i actually timed myself in real life and in the game walking from leeway harbor to dragon spine up to Albedo's camp because Nat is dating Albedo and sometimes she stops in Dragon Spine on her way home. And then from the camp to Mondstadt. And I think it took like nine hours in the game and it took me 18 minutes. Like I wasn't sprinting. Mm. So you're right. Like it seems like time is really weird in the game because it feels like nine hours is still very generous. Yeah. Like I feel like it should take me like a whole day, right? Or two days if you're going, you know, that whole route. Yeah. So it is interesting. Or even like you think of during the Windbloom event where Sino, Tignari, and Pale came from Sumeru. They mentioned that they stopped in Stone Gate, which is near Wuwang Hill, for a break. And I think they said they camped at Stone Gate, but like they must have stopped somewhere else. <laughs> Like, there is no way they only stopped in Stonegate. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, the world that we were playing in is, like, a condensed version of, like, what it would actually be. Mm. Like, every square of grass would be, like, you know, five squares of real grass, if that makes sense. Right, right. You know, you're right. So then, Brandon's favorite parts ensue. Albedo says, why don't y'all come back to my campsite? We'll chill. First off, we learn that Albedo can create stuff using his art. Which I'm not going to lie, they did kind of hint at during Albedo's trailer when he draws a crystal fly and the crystal fly comes to life. But also in his one trailer video, he tries to draw... What is it? It's that little, like, dinosaur-looking thing in Leeway that, like, spins. Like a baby... Oh, the, oh I know what you mean, but, the, like, the wheelie boy! Yeah, like, it's a baby Primo shop, basically. <laughs> You mean a Hot Wheels shop? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just a Hot Wheel motherfucker. He tries to draw one of those and Sucrose is like, don't do it in the trailer. And he does it. And then, you know, chaos ensues. And they walk back to Monset and they're like, we shouldn't talk about this. <laughs> so we know Albedo can now make stuff with his art and he offers to make everyone a chair. And that's when Eula's like, can I have one with a back? And we're like, yeah, bitch, you can have whatever you want. Albedo draws everything. Well, no, I think everyone's like, can I have one with a back? And Eula just sort of agrees. Oh, She's okay. like, I would also like a back on my chair. <laughs> yeah, they all want backs. It was so funny to me. Like, they were so specific. They should have asked for cushions. <laughs> I know, yeah. Like, they asked for these plain brown chairs. So, well, okay, so... Why not ask for a bed? Well, yeah, so... Well, they were going to eat. I have a lot of questions about this. Like, can he just draw whatever? Because at first I was thinking maybe this is sort of like, like a Plato forms, like, philosophical moment. If anyone's not familiar, like, the philosopher Plato from the 1500s <laughs> had... Hold up. Wait, fi- like, 1500 BC, right? Yes. Okay. BC, sorry. <laughs> Thank okay verification there (laughs) so he came up with like this whole thing of like the sort of ideal versions of things and how when you think of like a chair 
you think of a specific thing, even though there's like all kinds of chairs in the world. So can Albedo only do, you know, the ideal forms of things or can he do whatever he wants? So I think Albedo can do when it comes to non-living objects, whatever he wants. But what if it's like an in- extremely intense like internal mechanism i think that mm. as long as he's seen it before or he can truly visualize it that he can make it and i think that's honestly why he practices his art as much as he does mm. just like a 3d printer yeah basically but what's on the inside you know well i don't know he made a crystal fly come to life so you know but he couldn't make the baby of a shop come to life properly so i think he's struggling with like making things that are living which would make sense because gold also struggled with making living things i mean that's sort of the ultimate goal of the pure alchemist right is creating a living being yes so he makes these chairs they cook dinner and let me tell you albedo has never looked happier he's like friends like i (laughs) i could see this picture in my head of him turning and just smiling at the traveler he's like yes (laughs) I believe there is some personification. (laughs) No, 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 no. She's just like, oh, he would be so happy here. I love him. No, no, he is happy. (laughs) He's the bestest boy. Well, yes, but (laughs) this photo will be on our site. I have a screenshot of it on my phone. He is so on my. It's my background. No, I, <laughs> the layers that just keep unraveling. <laughs> I mean, we knew she loved him. <laughs> but to this extent... Have you guys ever seen this fucking picture of him? Like, there's a lot of memes about it because they're like Albedo when he feeds his friends uh, spiders. Oh, no. Oh, God. I oh. just remember the one where, like, at the very beginning of this quest, he puts his thumb to his mouth, and it looks like he's putting his, th- like, lip and tongue to it. Like, Ugh. Wait, why is he feeding people spiders? Well, no, he didn't actually feed them spiders, but Albedo says the spiders make good snacks. They do. They're delicious. I remember this now. I'm like, no, this is why I would kill Albedo in a fuck, Mary kill. <laughs> Because he's going to try and feed you spiders. Yes. Like, no, anyone who wants to eat a spider can die. Wow. You want me to die? Wow. Yes. (laughs) If you want to eat spiders, you can go off a cliff. Sorry. Can you tell I hate spiders? (laughs) Just a a light little bit. I love these little arachnids. Anyway, so Albedo's, like, super happy. They have dinner together. And then, (laughs) Brandon, what happens after that? Oh, so yes, there's... Brandon. What happens after that? <laughs> there's a lot of gay stuff that happens. <laughs> that's it. Um, <laughs> that's it. No, the I... end. <laughs> the, the event ends. Goodbye. <laughs> I mean, for me, it kind of ended there. But <laughs> so, first of all, Eula and Amber are they've sort of been flirting this whole time and being like, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But then they sort of just out themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so Amber is talking to the group about how she and Eula go to Good Hunter together so often that Sarah knows their orders. Like she has it memorized. She's like, oh, I got y'all. Eula's kind of embarrassed by this. She's like, two people sharing a meal says nothing either way about the relationship about them. And then Albedo's like, well, that depends on if it's a one off or a regular occurrence. <laughs> <laughs> Albedo. <laughs> And Eula's like, oh, so closeted. <laughs> and then she excuses herself at one point to go for an ice bath. And Amber's like, wait, I'm coming with you. It's late. It's dark. And you're bad with directions. <laughs> and then Paimon's like, an ice bath? <laughs> yeah, I also said the same thing. I was like, you're on Dragon's Fine. That is the <laughs> last thing. I'd be looking for the hot spring. Like... Come on. Mm-hmm. I don't think they actually were taking an ice bath, to be honest. So this is sort of, I think, the beginning, like the the seed that sprouted a million U Lamber fanfics. Mm-hmm. It was it was so fun. It was so cute. And I, I remember like playing this and be like, um, what? 
like they're going this gay like, <laughs> like, for real they went all out <laughs> like i was taking screenshots i was like this is so queer i really loved it and in the meantime while yula and amber are out doing whatever they might be doing bathing together paimon is like albedo paint me basically <laughs> paint me like one of your french girls yeah literally <laughs> she's like please <laughs> And so we go out and we try our best to paint Paimon following Albedo's instructions. And there were some goofy options out there. Like no one made a good painting of Paimon. I think mine was in a pot. I think I was cooking her. (laughs) I loved all of those. Those were the best. Why couldn't we keep that? Instead, though, at the end of this quest, you did keep to keep Albedo's version of the portrait of Paimon. And wasn't Paimon like so moved? When she saw it. Yeah. Well, first of all, Paimon was offended by ours. Of course. <laughs> well, yeah. But yeah, she was like really like like almost teary eyed over Albedo's portrait of her. I really thought that was so sweet. I have it as a coaster. <laughs> and the coaster came with a stand for it that looks like a little uh easel. Wait, did the that I got you that had one, right? I Al gave me a like a figurine of Albedo painting, and it also came with the Paimon painting. Aww. It should have came with the fucking goofy ass one. That would have been amazing. <laughs> I actually used the blank version of that canvas for my master's graduation invites. <laughs> I was like, we did this adventure together. Now come celebrate. And it was the traveler like, oh yeah, like next to the painting. <laughs> I digress though. Nerd. I know, literally. Like, who graduates from their master's program and then has a Genshin themed grad party? I did. So, eventually, after our paintings and everything, we all go to bed. Yule Amber re- reappear at some point. We all sleep in the lab on our chairs with backs. And then. Yule, Yule Amber, they come back like exhausted. Like. <laughs> Uh, I'm ready for bed. Um, Everyone's like, Eula's like, mm-hmm. smoking a cigarette. <laughs> Amber's hair is in one ponytail now, <laughs> and she's missing her headband. <laughs> <laughs> so we wake up the next morning. We start literally there moseying out of the lab, like very cash walking. And Albedo, who is the last in line, sees a rock fall in front of him, and he looks up and realizes that an avalanche is about to happen. So he yells avalanche to warn everyone, and then, Brandon, what happens? Eula grabs Amber and pulls her to safety close to her body. Literally, the (laughs) tightest hug. It's so good. There's a gif slash gif of it out there and it's so good it is it, honestly every time i watch that scene because i watch this scene at least once a week because you know serotonin <laughs> and i'm like what every time <laughs> she doesn't care about anyone else yeah she, she grabs amber she's like fuck everyone else amber you're important that is her wife <laughs> then the traveler and paimon kind of jump to the side and of course fucking bennett back falls like tumbles over his feet and starts to fall off the mountain edge and albedo goes to grab his hand and ends up jumping after him down this avalanche which i have questions about like we know that bennett and albedo do get separated and we'll talk about that in a second but like how did they survive do you think Albedo, like, made his elevator thing happen, maybe, and it, like, caught them? Well, that's the thing. Bennett doesn't remember Albedo coming after him, and he doesn't see Albedo after this when we go find them. So I think I think Albedo just kind of missed, or something else might have happened. One of the susses interjected. Exactly. Because Bennett was going to survive. He has bad luck, but he always lives, so. Exactly. So after this avalanche passes, we run down the mountain looking for Albedo and Bennett. We find Bennett. We have not found Albedo. And Eula suggests that we take, like, a break. She's like, we need to, like, take a pause and, like, catch our breath and, like, let our hearts not race. Yeah, she's, like, very freaked out because her girlfriend almost died. <laughs> I love how automatic, you know, her response was for snatching up Amber, especially because Eula is not someone who voices any kind of emotion. So I feel like her automatically grabbing Amber and pulling her to safety was like such 
a big moment for the lesbians. <laughs> That let's this go game. lesbians let's go let's lesbians go. let's go yeah i i really loved it so uh, sorry i was still thinking about that it was a hot <laughs> scene man it was hot i love that billy is becoming like our mascot slowly <laughs> <laughs> so we take a break and albedo kind of pops out of nowhere and we are feeling very suspicious of albedo and ayula also pulls us to the side and tells us that she is feeling suspicious of albedo at this point albedo attacks us i don't know if he's trying to attack us or eula but we push eula out of the way we kind of have a face off with him then eula does Then Amber and Bennett are kind of like alerted to what's happening. And this amazing cut scene happens where everyone is fighting Albedo. I still remember Amber's arrow. Yes, because she barely missed him. And she didn't really miss him. He moved. Which at this point, you're starting to get really suspicious. Because if you are someone who really didn't notice the diamond thing from earlier, this Albedo didn't have a diamond again. Big, big diamond. If you don't know herda now which is funny because there's also a herda in monstat just saying but if you were someone who never noticed this whole diamond thing now you're also suspicious of albedo because he's using ice powers and you're like this cannot be albedo how does he have a cryo vision all of a sudden like i don't get it this man was a geo bitch literally with his geo vision still right there too you're like what the fuck is happening (laughs) so eventually like there was he made this huge ice thing and like Bennett came down on it with his sword of fire. Super cool shit. And this Albedo is like starting to make this huge cryo thing in the air. And as he's about to drop it down, he gets stabbed from behind by the real Albedo. I was shook. A mouth still gaped from earlier. <laughs> like still on the ground. Hymon flips out and hides behind the traveler. She's like, Albedo, what's happening? And Albedo rips his sword out of the suspicious character, backs away. The sus character falls to his knees, screams into the air. Albedo warns everyone that whatever's happening is not over. And the imposter turns into a giant whopper flower that we've been calling Whoppy, but I think its actual name is the Fell Flower. Yes, it is the Fell Flower. I believe that's the name of the little part of the quest and stuff too. It's beautiful outside of its murderous tendencies. It's actually quite a pretty flower. Agreed. And I think that the Fell Flower looks eerily familiar to the light on top of the circus tent in Bottle Land in the yes. event right now so we have to fight the fell flower now after you defeat the fell flower in the actual event thing you could continue to fight the fell flower to get your refinements for the cinnabar spindle and i will tell you i did not do it my cinnabar spindle is two is r2 <laughs> i hated fighting that flower i thought it was so hard yeah i think i remember at that point i mean i think i was still in the newbie side of things so, which is also why I didn't like Dragon Spine that much because they couldn't really survive there <laughs> too much. And we beat the Fell Flower. We basically say that we were suspicious. And Albedo's like, How did you know it wasn't me? And that's when we say that we thought it was your neck, basically. <laughs> we be looking at your neck. Albedo doesn't say much, but we like help the others and we get them directed back toward the Dragon Spine base camp in Cyrus. And we end up going back to Albedo's campsite and talking with him again. And that's when Albedo tells us that his star is actually something he considers a birthmark. But that is where he was born. Like, he was born out of this star in his neck using the alchemy. Like, I just imagine, like, a star kind of appearing and then a human, like, blubbing out of it. (laughs) Do you think this is kind of like, because his constellation is a fetus in a bottle... That was where his umbilical cord was. So he technically doesn't have a belly button. I, I'd be totally possible. I don't know why that idea just gave me like a really weird feeling. Like having your umbilical cord in your neck. I just got a little grossed out. <laughs> Do y'all remember Whoa. the TV show uh, from ABC Family where the dude did not have a belly button? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's just what I can, what I think. The sci fi show. <laughs> yes. Well, we do know that Albedo was most likely some sort of test tube baby because of the Hex and Circle, like, reveal teaser, too. So we know that, like, he wasn't necessarily just, like, formed in the air 
type of thing. <laughs> so it's possible that, you know, he had an umbilical cord of sorts in his neck. We don't wait, really what, know. Wait, what do you mean? Can you explain that? In that trailer for the Hexen Circle, we see a little albedo in a bottle. He's like a genie in a bottle almost. <laughs> I'm a little albedo in a bottle. I'm a bottle, baby. <laughs> Gotta rub me the right way. Oh, <laughs> I promise yeah. I'll never sing again. No, do you it, do it, do it. Not <laughs> Always sing. Singing is fun. But yes, we know, you know, he was something. <laughs> he didn't just appear in the air. But <laughs> Albedo tells us that his star is like his marking. It's his birthmark. That's where like the alchemy magic happened. It's where the glass blowing ended. Yes, that's where the glass blowing of the human ended. And Albedo tells us, he's just talking to us about it, basically. And Paimon is like, you know, Albedo, we should come up with stories that explain what happened here on Dragon's Spine. And they agree to it. And as we're agreeing to that, Eula and Amber come and find us. And they're like, hey, come back to base camp with us. So we tell Albedo we'll be back for him. And we'll be back with our stories and whatever. You, Lambert, came up for air. <laughs> <laughs> yes, basically. They needed some more alone time. And they come back, get us, and we return to base camp with them, where we find out Joel's father is back. I can't. Joseph. Which, first off, Joseph. I thought it was jo- uh, Joseph. Does it have an F at the end? I thought it did. That's what I've been saying, Joseph. Yes. Yeah, Joseph. Oh, I'm not hearing the... I'm... Look. <laughs> Joseph. Joseph. I-, I thought, though, that Joseph was supposed to be Joseph, and somebody, like, misspelled it, and then they're like, ah, crap, you gotta keep it. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I <laughs> want that to be the, the thing. That would be <laughs> that so just- cool. <laughs> the Siri just didn't pick that one up. <laughs> exactly. But I thought, in this... Correct me if I'm wrong. The world quest where we're kind of unlocking Dragon Spine. I thought we confirmed that Joel's dad was dead. Yes, he is. He's dead. We find that actually in the, uh, what's it called? Lost in the Snow? Yes. The evil quest that first sends us to Dragon Spine before we're ready for it. Oh, I didn't realize that. And then like when you can actually do that quest, you find out that he is dead. Oh, interesting. I always thought it was more of like an assumption. Like there's no way he could have survived this long type of thing. But it confirmed well, it. Well, I mean, yeah, sure. But they kind of make it clear in the quest that, oh, he died. Let's not tell Joel. Okay. Then we got fake daddy. Yeah. Who looks way too similar to Pallid. <laughs> maybe th- <gasps> maybe that's what it is. <laughs> Joel's dad's really dead. And they're like, well, we got to like convince him of something. Pallid's like, I'll just change my clothes and we'll just pretend my name is Joseph. And I'll just stand in. No. No, Pallid no. is standing right there. <laughs> I'll have, let me have my dreams. No, 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 no fake dreams here. Poor little Joel. I mean, am I the only one that just assumed that was a Suspedo? I think it's a Suspedo. I think it's something sus. I don't know if I thought it was Suspedo. I thought it was something wackadoodle going on. Like, they they can, you know, change form, not only into Albedo, but other people. Which, mm-hmm. I mean, if Joel's dad died on the mountain, that makes sense because they could take his blood or whatever and like reform themselves into him which would explain he says and this is why his memories are kind of fucked up he woke up covered in blood wait who said this joseph joseph yeah when he's explaining well don't you remember going like doing these specific things right beforehand before he disappeared and he's like no all i can remember was i think what falling or being attacked and then waking up covered in blood. Oh, so he was with Joel's dad. He's saying that as Joel's dad. As yeah. Joel's dad. As yeah, Joe Surf, who is saying Oh, Joe Surf is Joel's dad. Okay. Yeah, he says that he woke up covered in blood. Which is why I think it might not be Suspedo, but another creation that Suspedo made to kind of plant. What if it's Dodore? Oh god. Oh god. <laughs> no. I think it's possible. Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, I'm sorry. But it will talk more about like the Joe Surf situation in a second. Wait, does that mean that when Nahida gets Dottori to delete all of his extras <laughs> that Joel loses his dad again? Oh, well then I can debunk that because Joe Surf is still at the Dragon's uh, Fire. Oh, okay. 
my crack theory is out the window. But uh, so we so after we leave to go ponder our stories and we find out this whole Joseph thing, it, there is a cutscene about Albedo. I think it actually might happen before we even get to Joseph, but we can assume it's happening at the same time where he says that he should have known about his mastered failed specimen in the dragon's belly. And that this is where his story will truly begin. And he basically summarizes that, like, if he had been the failed experiment, he too would have tried to become himself. Like, he would have tried yes. to become the person living and enjoying their life in the Knights of Favonius. And it's a really beautiful part of the cutscene where he's saying, like, if we switched places, if you were the survivor... Then as the abandoned experiment, the failure of the primordial human project, I'd want to replace you too. Yeah. So it sort of cuts away and he's like, I would replicate your appearance. I would study your alchemy. I would create miraculous life forms to divert your attention. So it sort of reinforces the idea that Albedo has compassion for Suspedo. Yeah. Yeah. Which is interesting because, you know, we know of someone who made a puppet and threw them away because they had empathy. It's interesting that Gold saw the empathetic character as good and didn't throw Albedo away. <laughs> I also think it's really interesting because Albedo is almost suggesting like a nature versus nurture concept here, too. Like the idea that this imposter of Albedo did not get treated well and was abandoned and is now trying to become the albedo that was treated well too the idea yeah. that if albedo had been in that situation and he hadn't been nurtured in the ways that he was even though let's be honest albedo doesn't get the most love from gold either if only suspedo knew you know he's saying that i too would want that nurturing and i'd want to be in that situation yeah and i would do anything to feel joy and the, like the joy of being brought into the world mm -hmm. so it's it also reinforces the weird idea of like albedo versus suspedo are they in cahoots i think it shows that albedo at least at this point didn't know about suspedo you know that like he didn't help him get to the point he's at for sure it also shows an interesting cutscene where you know albedo like catches the snow in his hand and he looks up and we don't know if he's looking at it or not but in the distance there's another albedo who we can assume is suspedo like standing on a mountaintop and then our albedo walks away at the end of this cutscene holding his sword ready to fight so I don't know. I thought that maybe meant he was going out on the hunt to kill Suspedo. Right. And well, do you think when he's like doing his his whole soliloquy, like I would do that too? Like, is he talking about the Whopper Albedo? No, no. <laughs> I think at this point he knows that there's someone else out there. I think he knows that it couldn't have just been a Whopper flower. He mm -hmm. says something about Whopper flowers not really being that intelligent. So he knows there's Suspedo out there that created the Whopper Albedo. Yeah, he says that Whopper flowers are known to replicate and replace. And that it's a mm -hmm. Whopper flowers natural instinct, which A, I have a lot of questions about. But B, he's saying that like this Whopper flower wouldn't have been smart enough to like steal his notes and everything like that. Like, it would have just been there to kill him, basically, and then become him. And at that point, the idea is that Suspedo would have stepped in. But that's actually where the last part of the storyline actually comes into play. And that's when we return with our stories for Albedo. Well, I also want to mention when Albedo is doing his whole like monologue of like, I would do this too. I would replicate that. I would do that. Like, he also says... I would wait for the right moment, then dispose of you and the traveler, the sole person to have known your secret, yes. which is very disturbing because it makes me think that Suspedo is going to come back. Definitely. Unless Albedo did successfully kill him, which we're not really sure about. That also is weird. And we'll go into it a little bit more in a second. It's like the traveler knows his secret now that he is made of alchemy, but so does gold. Like the traveler is not the only person that knows and i would assume alice might even know but for sure gold knows so it also brings into a qu into question whether or not gold is alive so after this whole sol soliloquy after the whole joe surf is alive situation we go back to dragon spine to talk with albedo and kind of tell our stories to him and Paimon tells some story and she tells her story, blah, 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 blah. So then Albedo tells his story. And Albedo basically tells the story of 
a brilliant alchemist who, you know, does their creations, creates a dragon, talks about like the belly of the beast, blah, 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 blah. But then he uses an analogy of a gardener. And he says that only a gardener would be able to tell the difference between three roses. And he refers to them all as subjects. And so he calls himself subject one, even though, you know, this is a quote unquote story. We know it's real. And he basically says, you know, that this brilliant alchemist created subject one who went out and lived amongst the humans blending in. And that subject two, which had been fed to a dragon, was brought back to life by the blood of the dead dragon and decided that they wanted to live the life of subject one. And then made subject three in hopes of distracting subject one so that he could then kill subject one and three and subject two would take over. Okay. So that is basically describing what we just did, which is, you know, the Whopper flower was subject three and that was supposed to be a distraction. But then someone else knew the story of Albedo. So now there was kind of a wrench thrown into this story for subject two and the murdering. And that's when he makes that gardener analogy and says that only the gardener would know the difference between three roses. And so at first, that to me suggests that gold who is the true creator would be the only person to know but based on what brandon just said based on the little monologue that albedo gave earlier it is suggesting that the person who is the gardener is actually the traveler because the traveler is the only person who knows their secret now i found that very interesting and it makes me feel like gold is dead and i think we've said that in a few other episodes that maybe she's dead because alice is trying to be albedo's mom and Yada, well, I mean, yada. that's every episode, Feeny. Well, I like <laughs> they're either going to die or they're dead. I mean, that's just how the game works. <laughs> or they've been captured by Alice. <laughs> no, but I like where you're going. What really drew my attention is that maybe Albedo has a deal with Suspedo. Like maybe they're working together and that Albedo felt guilty and he sort of stepped aside and is allowing Suspedo to live his life. Oh. That's interesting. That is interesting, but I hope it's not true. I kind of want it to be true because we see that Albedo is definitely the more altruistic creation of gold because Suspedo just wants, you know, live. I feel like his monologue made it sound like he really empathizes with the other one. Absolutely. I won't get too into it (laughs) because we do plan on doing an Albedo episode next season, but... I do not think that Albedo has let Suspedo replace him. And my reasoning for that is that we run into him too many times afterwards in different events where he still knows too much about, like, us. And he knows a lot about Alice and Clee. Like, I think even if Albedo was gonna let Suspedo, like, go and vibe in his life, that he would leave out certain things to protect the people he cares about, especially Clee. And there are things that Albedo mm. says about Alice and Clee that I just don't think he would let Suspedo in on. Also want to mention this was brought up during our mailbag episode. Yeah, it was. So we talked about this topic a little bit before on a previous episode. And, you know, I stick to my thought that I would like to see a redemption arc for Suspedo. I would love for there to, to be two Albedos that are both good, but yeah, we'll see. And just another really fun fact to note, too, is that Suspedo's name, and we've mentioned this before, too, but I want to mention it again because I think it's important. His name in the database is Dorian, you know, like Dorian Gray, which Al has definitely talked about in previous episodes, including our mailbag. Absolutely. And like, again, Genshin loves to take literature and throw it into the game and, you know, take things from it and imbue it into characters or events. And this definitely is something a bit similar, but I want, I I don't know if I should go further into that just yet. Okay. Okay. No problem. Mm. We'll keep it short for now. Yeah. But Dorian Gray, keep it in your mind. (laughs) You know, there's just one other thing, but this isn't where the event ends also. But I will say back to the gardener thing, I think it's really interesting, too, that Albedo uses, like, the symbolism of a gardener and his roses. Because last week when we did our Twin Archon story, we actually brought up the whole Veer's melancholy story about a gardener example as well. 
and how like the gardener story in Ver's Melancholy, I think it was chapter nine, is like also could be referencing of how the Sakura tree was created. So I think it's interesting that there's a lot of gardening examples going on in this game. I'm wondering if that is like a hint to something greater in the game as well. But then we return to Monstat. And I don't know if it's a day or two later, Paimon is still stuck on her fucking juicer. And she goes up to Timaeus again and is like, hey, juicer. And he's (laughs) like, no, again. And then Albedo shows up and Timaeus is like, thank God you're here. This bitch wants a juicer. Tell her no. (laughs) And we start talking with Albedo. And this is when I don't know what happened. And we've talked about it before, not on the pod, but together. But so there is this flash of like Albedo and we're talking with him and he has no star on his neck. But then it kind of goes into like the flashback lighting where we see him like from the very beginning of the storyline when we approach Timaeus and Sucrose where he, he has his back to us, but he doesn't have a star on his neck. And then when that flashback lighting ends and it goes back to Albedo, he does have a star on his neck. And we kind of say something, we're like, oh, his neck. And Albedo's like, what? Do I have something on my neck? And he's like, you're looking at me as if you're looking at someone who just pulled a really bad, impractical joke on you. <laughs> Are you a vampire? My eyes are up here. It literally, he's like, stop. There's a lot of questions out there about whether or not that's actually Albedo we're talking to at the end. And for me, I don't think I really realized it until watching it again in the last week that it goes into that flashback lighting too. Yeah. So... You know, they're suggesting that Suspedo is who we see at the very beginning, which makes sense because he was kind of rude to Timaeus. And I don't think Albedo would be rude to Timaeus. But then it's like, are they suggesting that that's Albedo, like who's now learned to hide his star to blend into the Garden of Roses? Yeah, because doesn't he say that he was playing a joke on us or something? Well, he says we're looking at him like someone who just played like a... A joke on someone. Oh, okay. A prank on them, which is an odd thing to say if you weren't playing a prank on somebody. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like he knows too much to be suspeto, right? Is that his way of like joking around, you know? Like, yeah, I'm just not sure who I feel was actually doing the joking. I know. Yeah. yeah that's the whole mystery. I will say, I feel like suspeto wouldn't know the whole thing about the star. Cause like we said earlier, we know that suspeto thinks that the star represents imperfection. So I don't think that he would know to mess around with us about the star. You know, I don't know, like, or they're working together, or did he catch on? And it 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 was Albedo, and he's like, I could be Suspedo. We're doing the same thing. Oh, I don't think that. I just think Albedo figured out how to hide his star using alchemy, so that he could like, I guess, in case subject two makes subjects like four, five, and six, he could blend in type of thing. Yeah, and in that theory, it makes sense because I guess he could have always hidden that mark Mm -hmm. but they made such a thing of it of him being sort of proud of it right because that is where he's born from it's his birthmark yeah Yeah. he loves like even though i don't think he should he loves gold like and that's her pride and joy in that mark right there that is the provenness of her success so who knows it's a big question we'd love to know what you travelers think so let us know your thoughts is it albedo at the end or suspedo or just an imposter a different imposter is it gold i don't know (laughs) Is it Albedo number four? It's a whoopee number two. And it's funny because Paimon, you know, is still talking to Albedo about how she's going to keep her fruits good for so long. And P- Albedo is like, well, Albedo, Suspedo, we don't know. He's like, you know, you could just like keep them on dragon spine and with me. Like if they stay cold, they won't go bad. Though by the time you come back to get them, you could have just picked a bunch more. And then he suggests creating a garden because if if we create a garden, we could then have like an orchard of the sun. I think it's sunsetias that she's trying to do this with. Mm-hmm. And then Paimon's like, I don't want to be a gardener. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting. We're bringing up gardeners again. And Albedo says, I don't think being a gardener would be that bad. Which is like, hmm, you brought up being a gardener about the roses the last time we saw you. And now you're telling us you don't think it'd be a bad thing to be like creating and knowing the difference. Like, I don't know if this is on purpose or what who's gonna prune this garden yeah well that's paimon says paimon's like i'm not doing that so then albedo goes though we really can't grow anything on dragon spine 
But if we could, we'd have a lot more people coming to Dragon Spine. And then he says, a little life is the key to attracting people. And that's where the event ends. Mm, suspedo. <laughs> it's very suspicious. <laughs> But I don't know, like, I definitely think Albedo is alive. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't think he's been replaced at all. I mean, I hope so. I hope he's not dead on Dragon Spine somewhere. Clee would cry. It just, he implanted his... I'm surprised you're not like, he's dead. Albedo died. No, I like Albedo. She's gonna kill her favorites. (laughs) Yeah, I can kill my faves. Come on. (laughs) <laughs> but you kill your faves all the time in the future. You're like, they're going to die. When the game ends. Because I know they're <laughs> going to break my heart. But for now, they're safe. Mm-hmm. Did anyone else get, like, kind of the thing with this event? The thing? Yeah. Like, the, the movie. Oh. What? <laughs> the movie, the thing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, it's like, what is the thing? Where it's like, you don't know who it is. Unless, yeah. like, you have these very small hints, like, oh, they're outside. Why Why do they not have, like, cold breath coming out? Wow, that's a... That, Al, you're too young to know that reference, so applause to you. No, I'm not. <laughs> My scene of another is uh, a, a very big fan uh, of Caress. <laughs> it's a great movie. It's yeah. so good. I totally get the uh, reference. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it's funny you say that, Al, because I don't know if it was when Albedo first came out. I, yeah, I think it was when Albedo first came out in the game. There was an issue, like there was a glitch where Albedo was the only character on Dragon Spine that didn't breathe out like cold air. Like you could see everyone's breath, but Albedo's. Oh. And so people were already suspicious from the start that he was a synthetic human. <laughs> That's funny. He, he still shouldn't have to because he's chalk. He's still a human. He's a synthetic human. He needs to breathe. Anyway. <laughs> so it, when this event happened, people were very shocked. I also felt on top of that, that this event felt like Scooby-Doo, where they were just like pulling yeah. the masks off. Like, who's <laughs> under the mask? It's Albedo? <laughs> Again? <laughs> like, yeah. It's a whopper flower. No, it's Albedo. Like, when they're explaining subjects one, two, and three at the end. Mm-hmm. Speaking of natural versus artificial life. So, Albedo actually talks about that. He describes, like, when he comes out, he describes, like, what is natural versus synthetic life. And natural life, he says that energy flows from within, and that's why the flower buds bloom and the curled leaves unfold, whereas artificial life involves introduction of an external source of energy into the embryonic life form, which makes me wonder, like, what was the actual energy source? And does he have to recharge? (laughs) Does he have to plug in? I mean, like most introverts, he'll have to recharge. (laughs) (laughs) Or is he just bathing in his brother's blood? No, no, no. Bathing in his blood. Bathing in his blood. (laughs) But even his blood. Well, I mean, why do you think he's got to be on Dragon Spine all the time? He's got to recharge. It's a good point. It's a good point. Who would choose to be on Dragon Spine? Me. (laughs) Only because he's got to bathe in his blood. (laughs) I have one small little thing that I I thought was interesting. And it was kind of going into like when you said that the whole idea of gardening and the flowers kind of being a reoccurring story. But like Albedo's story to us where he's actually telling us the truth reminded me a lot about Nahida in Ermansol when she's talking about Wanderer. Like it's kind of like a little hidden little piece in there. And I almost felt like that was his way of hiding a real story inside a fake story in case something ever happened. True. It would be able to be found again. I thought that was pretty cool. I could be stretching for that, but... No, and if anyone was going to know it, it would be the son of gold and nephew of Alice, like the Hex and Circle witches that supposedly go and hang out in Urban Soul. Yeah. He would know that he has to do parables and things like that for things to be remembered. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good point. I wonder if Klee knows the story. Mm. I wonder how much he actually knows. Yeah, well, you know... And not to get too, again, deep into Albedo in general, but we know that Albedo traveled a lot with Gold and, like, helped with her research. So I don't know if, like, Gold was really talking to him or if he was really just assisting the whole time. Like, I don't think he knows as much as people think he does. I know he thinks, you know, some bad things about himself and he's worried, but... So he really is a himbo? No, he's not a himbo. He's a genius. <laughs> All geo men are himbos. No. Mm-hmm. No. He's just a very smart himbo. <laughs> no. 
He's a juxtaposition. No, no. He's an <laughs> artist. He's a musician. But we'll learn all about that in season oh, three. You're describing himbos. Go ahead. No, I'm not. <laughs> anyway, we'll discuss more of that in season three. So, travelers, thank you so much today for coming back in time with us and discussing Shadows and Mist Snowstorms. Next week, we are going to be talking about the Gwili Assembly. If you like this episode or you want to let us know your thoughts on if that is Albedo or Suspedo there at the end, you can give us a follow on Instagram and message us there, Tales of Tavat Pod, or message us on Twitter, Tales of Tavat. You can also send us an email, Tales of Tavat Pod at gmail.com. Otherwise, travelers, safe journeys. We'll see you next time. Bye, Whopper Nerds. Bye.